Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back. After a three-day commercial break, we're, you're back on tuned into the channel for CS224. And uh, we'll have a two-hour program today. We hope that you'll enjoy it. Please uh, patronize our subscribers, our advertisers. All right, um, the show will go on. If you remember, just a quick review. What we did last time was we talked about hazards. We said pipelining can get you into trouble. You can end up with structural hazards if you don't design the pipe correctly. You can end up with data hazards if the code is organized in such a way to cause dependencies. And you can have control hazards. So we've got all three kinds. Now, <clears throat> one way to resolve hazards <clears throat> is by waiting, but that means we lose performance. So we prefer not to wait if we can find better ways. We looked at structural hazards. We said if you're trying to use the same element in the same cycle, you can't do it. So that's not going to work unless those are different memories. But they can be. That can be a data memory, and that can be an instruction memory. So that, that would work out for uh, memory hazards. Then you can see we're also trying to use the register file in the same cycle. And that won't work unless we design a way to let it write into it and read from it um, at the same time. In fact, we prefer to write into it first so that we can read that data. In other words, the data that we write into it here could be read out here in the second half of the clock cycle, but we have to make sure the write is done in the first half of the clock cycle. And the way we do it is we make the timing edge for this register file to be the opposite edge from the timing edge for the uh, pipeline registers. That means that it can take a data at the half cycle point and then give that data out uh, and be loaded into the register of the pipeline stage following that. So that will work. All right, now, uh, there is sometimes, though, when we have hazards not caused by structures, but caused by code. And when you have the following situation, um, I'm going to change the value of register 1, and then I need it in the next instruction, and I need it in the next instruction, and I need it, and I need it. You can see that first I'm uh, writing, and then I'm reading. So this is read after write. And so we call this a read after write hazard. And you can see what happened. Um, when I read it here in the second stage of that instruction, it's not written yet because the time axis is this way. That means that the first instruction actually does the addition and puts the value back into register 1 in this cycle. But you're asking to read it here in an earlier cycle. You're asking to read it here in an earlier cycle. You're asking to read it here in the same cycle. You're asking to read it here in a later cycle. So you can see the reason that the arrows are red and that they're green. The green arrows mean it's later in time, no problem. This register read will get this value. So therefore, changing uh, register 1 here will cause this read to get the new value. And the same thing happens here. This it will be the new value of register 1, no problem. It's enough after the add, as you can see that in time it's later. But what about these? What about these? Arrows that go backwards in time are called hazards. Can everybody see that what I'm trying to do here is read out a value of register 1 and register 5, and the problem is I'm not going to get this value as it's changed. I'm going to get the old value as it existed at that point in time. In other words, Right here, I'm still doing the addition. And I'm putting it in here. So earlier in time means it's not put in. I cannot get the new value that early in time from the register file. So the, the direction of the arrow shows if it's a hazard. If it's backwards in time, it's a hazard. If it's forwards in time, it's not a hazard. OK, so yes, pipelining can get us into trouble. Now, can anybody uh, suggest some ways to get out of trouble? Yeah, wait. We said wait always works. What would happen if I put in a no-op and a no-op? Two instructions that don't do anything. Well, then that means this would be later in time, and this one would be down here, and so it would be fine. So delaying and wasting time is a good way to uh, assure that we don't get the wrong values from register 1 here. But we don't like that. We said we don't like to just solve it by waiting, because we lose performance that way. Right now, as everybody can see, I'm going to finish this instruction in this cycle, this instruction in this cycle, this instruction in this cycle. So I've got that nice heartbeat of one instruction is finished per clock cycle. CPI is one. As soon as you put in two no ops, what happens? Get a result, uh, no result, uh, no re it'd be like turning on the water in your bathroom and no water comes out. 
Okay, we don't want that. That's, a, that's not our ideal at all. So one way to solve it is waste time with putting in no op, no op. No op means no operation. It's just an instruction whose values are all zero and doesn't do anything. But let's see if we can find a better solution. What else could we do? You know, instead of putting in useless instructions here that don't do anything, would it be possible to put in some useful instructions? What if I was to put in something here that didn't read and didn't write register 1, or something that used register 3 and 5 and 7? Didn't use register 1. So it filled up the gap and pushed these down, but did useful work. That's called code reordering changing the order of the assembly language instructions in order to keep the pipeline moving and not lose performance. Okay? Now who would do code reordering? Who would change the order of assembly language instructions? It would be a compiler job, right? And not every, not every instruction is going to work. For example, is bringing this exclusive OR up to here a good candidate for filling the gap? No, because it uses register 1. So same problem. Instead of this being uh, dependent backwards in time, it'll be to that one. No, we have to find instructions that don't use register one. There's none of them visible here. Maybe they're here, maybe they're down here, but we could put them here. So code reordering, <clears throat> and smart compilers do that all the time. Smart compilers have to have that intelligence built in in order to keep the performance of the hardware high. They reorganize the order of the code, but they have to be sensitive to what's called data dependencies. Do you see why register one is colored here? There's a dependency, isn't there? The thing I want to write here, I need to read it here. <clears throat> so I'm reading it after I write it. Okay, it's called a read after write dependency. It turns out to be a hazard on this pipeline. There's other kinds of dependencies where you write a value after you wrote the value. There's dependencies where you write and then read. In this case, we, I mean, where you read and then write. So we don't want to get the wrong value. So whenever you have data dependencies in the order, one sure way to, is to finish completely the first instruction before you go to the one later, but that's against pipelining. So pipelining says don't finish it completely, just start it and then start the next one. And start the later ones before the earlier ones are done. That is the risk factor right there. So data dependencies in your code can turn into data hazards. It depends on the pipeline. In this pipeline, as you can see, two dependencies are hazards and two more are not. Two dependencies are hazards, two more are not. But can you imagine what would happen if there was a more stages here? A longer pipeline will mean a greater separation between this and this. And what will that mean? If I separate these out further in time, what will happen with more stages in my pipeline? The window of instructions gets bigger that are at risk of being a hazard. Does everybody see that? Or is right now, <coughs> the window between here and here is one, two, three. So one, two, three instructions are directly affected, and we fix that one by this little trick. So it's, you know, the, the length of that minus one. So these two are at risk. If I stretch this out, I'll just make the window of instructions that are at risk larger. If there's any data dependencies, those will be hazards if they're in that window. So the length of your pipeline determines the percentage of dependencies that turn into hazards. As you see here, I've got four dependencies, but only two of them are hazards, because the pipe is a short pipeline. So long pipelines have greater risks of this stuff, OK? Now, solving it by code reordering is one way. There's going to be another way that we're going to show in just a minute, but I'd like you to think about it first. So change the software was one fix. Drink tea and waste time was another fix. Got any other ideas? Yeah, OK, if stretching it out makes it worse, somehow shrinking it could make it better. Yeah, if I got rid of this memory stage here and just went from register, I mean, from ALU right into register, that'd be great. But then I wouldn't be able to do loads and stores. I could only do R type. These, as you notice, are all R type. Yeah, if I took that out, it would reduce the size of the window. Well, how about instead of making the hardware that different by removing a unit, <coughs> What if there was another solution that was modify the hardware but didn't hurt other instructions? Then we wouldn't depend upon the compiler to have to try and find code to reorder. You know what? The compiler might not find code to reorder because 
it has to have certain conditions. It can't have any dependencies on one, okay? But it also can't have dependencies on things previous to this, and it just might be there isn't any such instruction to move in, or it finds one but not two. So you can't always count on the compiler to be able to find a, a good candidate and put it in place. So reordering in software could be substituted for reordering in hardware. And fancy uh, modern processors actually reorder the instructions in hardware. They say, OK, I got that one. OK, I got that one. OK, I got that one. I'm going to change the order that I send them into the pipeline. So hardware reordering can actually happen. So, but reordering is one approach. It's, it only works if there's good candidates. Now, let's talk about change the hardware. Modify the hardware. I'd like to ask you the question, what am I writing back into this register file? What am I going to write in this register file? The new value of the results of that addition. Two things got added, it makes some result, and I'm going to put that result in R1. Tell me, do I know that result right here? I do, actually. Tell me, is that point there in time enough to give it to the subtraction or to the ending? From there to there, yes, is forward in time. So if I could take that result from that pipeline register and send it into the ALU instead of the old value, notice it's the RS value, so I don't want the old RS value coming out of register. I want to say, no, 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 no. I've got a new value for you. I want to have it right here. It's one day will be register one, but we haven't got there yet. But it, I know the value, and you don't care its name. You just want that value, and I've got it. Give it to you right now. Okay, we call that forwarding, because instead of going backwards in time, we're going forwarding in time. Now, if you look closely, you'll see that what's been done is the value stored in the pipeline register got sent to the front of the ALU. We're going to put a multiplexer here and give us a choice. That one, m or that one, m. So it means that the pipeline register has to give feedback to the input side of the ALU. And we'll have to have a mux there, and we'll have to choose, do we forward a value from my output around to my input, or do we just take the normal values out of register? And the answer is we forward when there's a data hazard, and we don't forward when there's not a data hazard. Pretty clear. So a modification of the hardware will be another possible solution to this. So now we got three solutions, actually four. First one is don't do anything, just fill it with no ops, stall the pipeline, waste time, waste hardware, wait, lose performance. Second one is reorder the instructions to try to put something not dependent on register one in the place. Software reordering would be done by the compiler, hardware reordering would be done literally in a very fancy control unit inside the processor. Third way is modify the pipeline's hardware itself to allow feedback which we have named forwarding because it gives us an arrow forward in time. Okay, now all these are solutions that have been used and are still continuing to be used. And you can tell that they range from very cheap, almost free, to very expensive. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'd like to see if anybody uh, has questions about that concept of forwarding. Okay, we're not there yet. You're going to see it in the next slides. So we're going to go through it. But right now, I've just introduced the idea of how to solve this problem. What's the problem? We have data dependencies that on this pipeline become data hazards. Okay? Data dependencies that when you pipeline in this way become hazards. Do all dependencies become hazards? No. Do dependencies on MIPS become hazards in some other architecture? Maybe not. Do, do pipelines that are longer have more hazards than shorter? Yes. Do CISC machines have more hazards than non-CISC? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, there's lots of things. It depends on the pipeline. So you want to design your CISC? Complex instruction set computer, risk, reduced instruction set computer. Okay, so we've got two different architectures. This is a risk, very simple, small, short pipeline with simple instructions. Doesn't have too many hazards, but as you see, it can have hazards. All right, let's go on. Uh, so we, this is a different kind of hazard. Look at this hazard. I do a load, which says put a new value in the register file, and then use it, use it, use it, use it. So once again, if this is when I can have it, then it's too late for that, and too late for that. It's in time for that, and in time for that. So it would appear to be that I have two hazards. The question is, would drinking tea and stalling fix the problem? If 
I put in two no-ops right here, push this down to here, will everything be okay? Yeah, except that I lost performance. Would reordering the code and sticking in two instructions from somewhere here that don't use register one solve the problem? It would. Would forwarding solve the problem with forwarding hardware? In other words, if I take the output of the ALU and I feed it to the input of the ALU, do I take care of my problem? No, because the output of this ALU is not this value. What is the output of the ALU? Yeah, it's the address. It's the addition of those two things. I don't want to put that in register one. What do I want to do? Use that and go to memory and get something out of memory. And what I get out of memory wants to go into register one. Okay. So I don't have to wait till it's written back into here to use it, but I do have to wait till it's here. So now my question is, when it's here in the pipeline register, I've gotten it out of memory, can I use it in time for this situation here? Yeah, if I stick it right in the ALU there, I can add it to register 7, I'll be okay. Can I get it to here in time? Can you see that? That's still backwards in time. So forwarding hardware does not solve the problem of what we call a load use Load use. Get it? I load, then I use. It's a load use hazard. It doesn't totally solve it. It reduced it to one instead of two, but it didn't reduce it to zero. Yeah, so now we've learned something else. All hazards cannot be solved by forwarding hardware. Depends on the pipeline. But in this case, this pipeline has got a load use hazard that does not go away with forwarding hardware. The read after write hazards did, but not the load use hazard. Now let's go on. Now we got branch hazards. Oh, did you, did you have a question? Was that a hand up? No, okay. Right, let's talk, before we go on, let's, let's see if there's any questions. So, so you must create So since we weren't able to solve it with forwarding, must we wait? Uh, subtraction uh, operation. Yeah. Yeah, this subtraction can't happen here. If it does, it's going to use wrong, a wrong value of this and get a wrong answer. So therefore, what do we have to do? Either push in a no-op or push in another instruction. But subtraction cannot happen in the next cycle after that. So therefore, our, we, our choices are reduced. Reorder the code or drink tea. That's all we can do. Yeah? You said that uh, this problem can be solved by the intelligent compiler. Uh, if it can find, if it can find instructions to put here, called code reordering, yeah, okay. yeah. But and I didn't say always, I said sometimes it can do, the, do something. And I also said hardware can do that reordering as well, yeah. yeah. Intelligent hardware, yeah, yeah. I just understand. Uh, while we are doing uh, our project, we make their order, and uh, we yes. uh, use lots of load, work, and read yes. after that, but yeah. we didn't you didn't think about pipelining, yes. and so you didn't realize that could cause a problem. Yes, but, but it didn't cause a problem. Why? Ha, because the Mars simulator is not a pipelined simulator. The Mars simulator finishes one instruction before it starts the next one. That's why. Mm. Yeah. It, it finishes completely and then says, now do the next one. It's a simulator, and so it's a software model of a single cycle processor, but not a pipelined processor. So you don't ever have uh, pr issues with, with the Mars uh, re related to data dependencies. Yeah, in your project you wrote lots of these kind of things and probably these kind of things too. You had all kind of data dependencies. You'd never heard of hazards. And what do you think would have been the emotional reaction if good code didn't work? You would have been very angry at me. You would have said, oh, da, 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 da. you didn't teach us about this. No fair, adilses, adilses, you know. So no, no, no. The Mars simulator, look, the first part of the course is about learning simple architecture, simple hardware. Now we're moving it up. Now we're starting to get into more complicated issues, including pipelining and the complications that come from that. You ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till you see where we're going to go. Okay, we've got a lot more to go. The second half of the course is a course about managing complexity because everything is performance, performance, performance. We're chasing after performance. We no longer want simplicity, keep it easy. We want performance. So, yeah, sure. Let's have, let's have a discussion here. Great, I liked your question, yeah. Uh, we solved the addition problem by connecting to Allo. Oops. Yeah. Uh, we solved the we, second line problem. Well, we claim we can solve. In a few more slides, you're going to see it. Right now, we're just talking concept. But I'm not sure everybody here has got the concept, actually. We, we, we're talking, but we're going to have to show some more slides. But, How can we yeah. solve the problem on third line? 
because uh, the third line mean this one? Yeah. Okay. Our uh, value in on uh, first line and we can connect hmm. all of the third. Yeah. Okay. His point is this: if the value I want is here, then forwarding it back to the input of the ALU does great for this. But uh, it doesn't do this, because what I need is to forward it from here to the input of the ALU two cycles later. That means I have to hold on to it somehow. Okay? Now, uh, in fact, I do hold on to it. The value that I get here goes to here, doesn't it? Yeah, it just goes around here and goes to there. We don't need a new memory. Okay, so now, if I had forwarding hardware from the output of memory to the input of the ALU, then I'd solve this one. Everybody see that? From the output of the ALU to the input of the ALU is what I need to do that one. And from the output of memory to the input of the ALU is what I need to do that one. So I have to actually have two sets of forwarding. The multiplexer now is a three to one multiplexer right here. It's going to say, do I take the value from register? Is it correct? If it's not correct, do I get the value off the ALU? If it's not correct, do I get the value off of memory? So it's actually going to have three inputs to choose from. And what it means is, Delayed one cycle, delayed two cycles, or delayed zero cycles. You know, so, yeah, that, that's right. It's getting a little more complicated. I didn't really want to go there because we're not seeing any pictures, but it's clever of you to realize that this one needs a different solution from this one. Yeah. So we called this thing forwarding hardware, and you can see it's going to involve feedback and a multiplexer, and then the multiplexer is going to need some control signals to decide who gets to go, just like the traffic policeman decides which lane of traffic is going to go through the intersection. Whenever you have a multiplexer, you need a control to decide who gets to go through. A multiplexer is a selector. Remember, it selects one of the input data paths and puts it on the output. So we're going to have to have some logic for handling forwarding some control logic for forwarding correctly. Do we not forward? Do we forward one clock cycle? Do we forward from two clock cycles? Yeah. All right, so let's go on. Now, branch instructions can also, well, let's don't go on. Let's make sure everybody got the concept at least. We're going to fix the problem of data hazards by some changes to our data path hardware. And we're calling that forwarding because it changes the direction of the arrow from red to green. Any, any questions or any comments or any objections? Or? Okay. All right, so that's for data dependencies. Now, we also have control hazards that can come from our branch instructions. This is something different. It's not related to data at all, but look what happens. Branch if equal to where? Someplace which isn't here. So I fetch the BEQ, and now it's time to go get the value out of registers, decoding it and, and, uh, and getting the register values. At the same time, I'm supposed to fetch something else. But what if I'm really going to branch and go here? That means I fetched the wrong instruction. Uh-oh. Since I don't know here, where I'm going to go to next, this comes too soon. All right, what are the solutions? What are the solutions? Drink a little tea and fill it with no operations. Put some stuff here that, you know, could go here to fill, the, fill it up. Shorten this so there's less. Yeah, but you can see what the problem is here. When do I know if they're equal or not? When do I know if the two register values are equal or not, and if I'm going to take the branch or not? Way over here, way over here at this point in time. But it's too late to catch this. So that's, that's a call a control hazard. You have to decide now what you're going to do, but it might be the wrong thing to do. So you can choose to make no decision. Just drink tea and wait. You could choose to make a decision. Let's go ahead and fetch this. And if it's wrong, we'll cancel and not change any values in memory or register, that's a possibility. You know, start down one of the paths, and if it's the wrong one, vazgech. So that means if you're right 50% of the time and wrong 50% of the time, at least you were, don't have to vazgech 50% of the time, you gained. I mean, what's, what's wrong with doing this and this and canceling it? That's no worse than no op, no op. Same thing, at least you, did, you took a chance on useful work. Maybe you know if it's gonna branch or not. Let me ask you a question here. Blah, 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 branch if equal to top. 
What is that? It's a loop, bottom tested loop. Tell me, do you think that most of the time here I'll be taking the branch or most of the time here I'll be not taking the branch? Yeah, most of the time loops generally run quite a few iterations. Might be 10, might be 100, might be 1,000. So it's a good chance to predict take the branch if it's top tested. Let's try another one. I mean bottom tested. Okay. So now the loop is top tested and we get to the bottom it just says go back to the top and run the test again. So now it's a top tested loop. Do you think we'll be taking the branch most of the time or not taking the branch most of the time? Not taking. So top tested loops, most of the time you just continue sequentially. So we could predict and get right most of the time on BEQs if they were loop BEQs and BNEs. Now let's try another one. Blah, blah, blah. BEQ, we go that way or we go that way, according to data. We never come back. It's not a loop. You think I should predict to do that? Or do that? Technically, it's like this. Right? You know, this is the sequential code. This is don't do that. Go somewhere else and do that. But we don't come back. It's no loop. So now what do you think the odds are? Yeah, I mean, can't guess any better than 50-50. Maybe we take that, maybe we take that, nobody knows. Yeah. So predicting branches is one of the ways to lower the penalty. When you're right, there's no penalty. When you're wrong, it's the same penalty as doing nothing. Everybody see that? Predicting branches is guessing, making intelligent guesses. This is something modern architectures do all the time to handle and reduce the penalty from control hazards as they predict branches. All right, now let's talk about some different pipeline structures. You know, you got a simple pipeline, five stage. Oh, sir, is that all there is? No, not at all. Uh, there's as many different pipeline architectures as there are uh, instruction set architectures and processor families. So let's have a look at a few. What happens if you have an operation that's real slow, like multiply or divide, and you know it's, it cannot finish in the same amount of time as an ALU operation? Well, one thing you could do is make the clock twice as slow you could put mull in the ALU and just say, but now it's a really slow ALU, so that has to, that has to, they all have to slow down and slow the clock down. Or you could say, well, mull is slow. Let it take two cycles. And while I'm doing this and doing that, I'm multiplying. So it takes two cycles. We know that mull doesn't use memory. So therefore, it's like a two-cycle ALU instruction because all our other ALU instructions do what? Compute in one, and then drink tea for one, and then continue. So we could just be computing in two. So there's a different architecture, and I, give, I hope gives you an idea about what to do with all slow instructions that cannot execute in a single clock cycle. Let them be longer. Let them take more than one stage in the pipeline. All right, now, what if the data memory address um, is twice as slow as the instruction memory, or as the, the, the data memory access, sorry. So this data memory now became really slow. This is okay, and this is okay, and this is okay, but this becomes the slow one. Okay, right there. Have it be a two cycle data memory address. So it just takes longer to get done when you're accessing memory for loads and stores. In fact, that's realistic. Going to data memory is not going to be as fast as, as the other stages in the pipeline. That's the slow one is when you access data memory. Now, can instruction memory be faster and data memory be slower? That's a little bit debatable. But memories in general are slower than registers. So it would make sense to slow down the memory accesses by giving them multiple cycles. So in other words, this and this and this look really fast compared to this and maybe this. Okay. Why would memory access be slower than register access? Number one reason is just bigger. Bigger things are slower. Yeah, exactly. This stores 32 and this stores 32,000 or 32 million. Of course, it's going to be slower to access. Yeah. Okay, so here's another way to approach the pipeline. Let's have a look at some other architectures. The ARM has a three-stage pipeline. The Xscale has got a, a seven-stage pipeline. These are alternative architectures. Why not? Okay. So you can see what's done in each stage is different. The, the architects divided up the work that needed to be done differently for different architectures. 
Okay, without going into too much detail, I think this pretty much explains what's going on here. So look what we got here. Two stages for instruction memory fetch. Register, shift, ALU, data memory, and then finally register and data memory two. Notice this, if you're writing to data memory, it takes two. If you're writing to register, you just skip and it takes one. So this is acknowledging that memories are slower than registers are. Okay, up here, PC access and, and fetch it out of instruction memory, decode it and get the uh, uh, operands, execute it in the ALU. If there's any data memory, do that. Shift and rotate the thing and write it back. Sounds like that's going to be awfully slow because they're doing an awful lot, but apparently they've decided to design it with three stages and therefore same clocks for each stage. Don't ask me how. Looks like the final one hasn't got a lot of work to do. Okay, so these are some different uh, pipeline architectures. So let's summarize our introduction to pipelining. We're going to go after the problems very seriously and very deeply in a lot of uh, detail in just a minute. But let's just kind of summarize where we've come so far. All modern day processors use pipelining. There's no going back to single stage. We're not going to do that. So we are going to understand how pipelines work because that's how they all work. Why do, they all, why do all modern processors use pipelining? It's so complicated. That's just one answer. Starts with a capital P. What is it? Performance, that's the answer. All modern processors want performance because all modern computer users want performance. So therefore, it wouldn't make sense to try to sell a processor that was low performance. Pipelining doesn't help the latency of a single task or single instruction, but it helps the throughput. You get more instructions done per period of time, but you don't get an instruction done any faster. A single instruction might be even a little bit slower in a pipeline because you've got to catch it and hold it in a register and catch it, and, so, and some stages are not equally balanced. And so in the end, the latency might actually increase, but you get a huge, huge gain in the throughput. So that's the key, is we're in, in computing in millions or billions of instructions per second, we're going to have a big gain. The potential speed up is that you get a CPI of one, and you have a very fast clock cycle. So whatever your clock cycle did in terms of getting shorter, that's your speed up. CCI is one. It's as long as we don't stall the pipeline, as long as we don't have to put in tea drinking no ops. If we put in tea drinking no ops, then I don't have a CPI of one. So every time I have a hazard I cannot resolve, whether it's structural, whether it's uh, data, or whether it's control, I lose performance and it becomes one point whatever. And so pipelines with 1.2 are not as good as pipelines as 1.1, and those are not as good as pipelines with 1.05, and pipelines with 1.000 never stall. They always give you a result every single clock cycle. That's a pretty ideal pipeline. That means it solved all hazards, and you're going to see in just a minute that can't really be done. Okay, so we're going to talk about a suboptimal, and the issue is how close to optimal can we get? All right, so that's the third point here. The pipeline rate that is the clock cycle, is limited by the slowest pipeline stage. That's why I made that comment back here about the EX stage. Looks like it's doing a lot of work. That's going to be the slowest. Probably it's going to cause, that's going to be the determiner for the clock. And you can see what was done here. In order to not limit the clock, IM was broken into two. In order to not limit the clock, the data memory access was broken into two so that we could have a fast clock cycle. Otherwise, it would limit the clock. Okay, so Unbalanced pipelines make for, or unbalanced stages make for inefficiencies. We want our pipeline to have the gain of n for n stages, they need to be balanced and not have some big ones and some little ones. The time to fill the pipeline and the time to drain it out can impact the performance if you're not running millions of lines of code. If you just run a little bit of code and it's a long pipeline, then the fill time becomes significant. But if you're running a lot of code and it's a, not a long pipeline, the fill time and the drain time are insignificant. So, you know, for deep pipelines and short code runs, maybe this is something, but otherwise we don't pay any attention to it, at least not at this undergraduate lesson one level. Now, the key point in the last part, though, was this. We must detect and we must resolve our hazards. What would happen if we didn't detect and resolve our hazards? What would happen? Yeah, it won't work correctly. What would happen if I didn't detect and resolve this hazard? I'll get the wrong value for register 1 here, I'll get the wrong value for register 4 here, and on my all and I'll go, I'll never know about it. So you're going to get 
wrong values for the traffic conditions or wrong values for the world global warming model or wrong values for the missile trajectory or wrong values for your population estimates or wrong values for your national budget or wrong values for whatever. You know, yeah, I mean, we, you know, whatever you're computing is going to be wrong, so we don't want to do that. So that's a must, too. We must detect and resolve hazards. Now, stalling, which is one way to resolve it, slow down and drink tea, negatively affects the CPI. It causes us to go this way, so we don't want to do that. Less than the ideal of one, or I should say more than the ideal of one, you know, it would be better because it gets higher than one. We don't want to do that if we can possibly avoid it. We will spend all kinds of effort to avoid stalling. Stalling is the last resort. If there's no other solution, then we'll stall. Okay. All right. That's the summary of the first part of the concept of pipelining. I'd like to know if everybody's comfortable with the idea. We're going to go in deep now. We're going to look at a lot of detail and try to get the details figured out. Okay. You ever heard the expression, the devil is in the details? You know. Oh, ha, yes, very nice. I know pipelining. And we skip to the next chapter, right? What well, means that you, you don't really understand it. The devil is in the details means the difficulty, the pain, the trouble is in the details. But if you don't go down to that level, you won't really get it. You won't understand it. So we're going to have to go face the devil now. OK? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> get ready to meet shaitan. <laughs> OK. All right, now I'm going to switch slide sets. And we're going to go to the next one. That was warm up to pipelining, okay? Sunderma. All right. Any questions? A little break time here. Any questions? I'm sorry it's not timed with the real break, but that's just the way it is. Um, yeah. Maybe it's unrealistic, but uh, can we use two flows uh, source? For example, one is two times faster for mm -hmm. the other one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we use the first one for the long instructions and the other one for the general instructions and maybe we can solve the, hmm. this other problem. Okay. Everybody hear what he said? Two clocks. One is fast, one is slow. Maybe it's a ratio of two to one, maybe not. But anyway, fast clock, slow clock. Okay. Remember, clocks go to hardware. So if hardware is too slow, the fast clock will not do any use for it ever. If it's fast enough, it doesn't need a slow clock. That's my first answer. Clocks go to hardware. They don't go to instructions. They go to physical circuits. If the circuit can switch in the time of the fast clock, what's the point in the slow clock? If it can't switch in time for the fast clock, it'll never be able to switch in time for the fast clock. It'll always need the slow clock. What's the point of the fast clock? You see what I mean? Well, uh, as you said, the intelligent hardware can uh, recognize the instruction and mm -hmm. uh, reorder them. So yeah, OK. Recognize the instruction, also it's done. OK, right. Now I'm going to give you an idea here. If accessing this register file takes 20 picoseconds, then uh, a clock that has a clock period of 15 picoseconds will never work with this. It'll always cause errors. And a clock that has a 30 picosecond clock cycle will always work with this and never have any problem at all. Because the hardware says, don't make me go any faster than 20 picoseconds. That's how much time I need from my inputs to my outputs. And this, this has a hardware limit. This has a hardware. They all have their, their, sort of their characteristic. You have a name and a height and an eye color. And so you know, if I bring you a shirt that's too small or pants that are too short, I can't change you to put those clothes on. That's kind of the analogy that, I, that I'm making. You're talking about fast clocks and slow clocks, but the hardware is fixed. The only thing that changes is the instructions that we want to do with the hardware, but the hardware is fixed. So how can I, how can I get the benefit of the fast and slow if I've got hardware that has a characteristic, like a height or an eye color or a shirt size? I mean, I'm open to the idea. It's, it's an interesting idea. Play with the clocks and have variable clocks. I mean, not the idea of change it, speed it up, slow it down, but have alternatives. Fast one now, OK, you're done now, slow one. But that idea still has um, you got to answer this question. Or if there's a limitation for uh, making mm -hmm. it faster, mm -hmm. we can make it slower. So if there's a limit, we can make the other one slower and uh, the uh, other one the usual. Mm -hmm. So if we make it slower, Mm -hmm. We can avoid uh, this uh, okay. test search limitation. Okay. All right. Talk to Eddie Orem. Creative thinking going on here. Uh, trying to find a solution to the problem in a different way. 
not change the hardware, change the clock, okay? Um, and intelligently handle it. Um, rather than go further, I'm just going to say I like it. The neurons are working. There's some activity there. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but anyway, we're into a discussion about it. All, all ideas start out as, hey, let's talk about this. What do you think, Ajaba? And then if it's something good, it passes all the tests, it passes all the attacks and defends itself and continues to be successful. If it's not, it dies an early death, okay? Oh, so I don't want to comment about how long your idea is going to live, but uh, I'm sure that it's been thought of before. Okay, that, you know it's a great idea, but it's not original, and uh, it has some problems. But you haven't seen them yet, and I haven't been able to explain them to you yet. But anyway, I, I just want to say that's great. He's got an idea, and he's thinking about how to make things better. In any area that you're studying, if you have an idea, hey, could we do this? Hey, what about this? That's, that shows that you're connecting with the topic. It shows that you're thinking, creative thinking. Okay, and I want to just you know praise that. The idea that we creatively think they're not all great ideas, but at least they're our ideas, okay? And I'm, I just want to praise that, okay? So good job. I'm not going to go any deeper in about variable clock rates. Now let's um, look in the third set of slides. Um, why pipeline? The answer is capital P. Where did it go? Performance. I mean, that's the answer right there. Once the pipeline's full, we start getting an instruction completed every clock cycle, so we get a CPI of 1. It takes a little while to fill the pipe. Once it's filled, then we start getting... Results. See how it's filled in the pink zone or the red zone? Filled means every stage is doing some useful work. It's not filled here. It's not filled here. It's not filled here. It's not even filled here. Because in this one, in that clock cycle, nobody's doing right back. But now, in that stage, we're doing right back and all the other things. So once the clock is filled, it'll continue to stay full until you don't give it any more instructions. All right, once the pipe is filled. Now, uh, remember we had um, uh, data and control paths for our pipelining. What we said was, we're going to take the instruction 6-bit opcode and determine what the control values need to be and save them, use them where we need them, pass them along uh, to the three stages that follow. So the first stage does the same thing all the time. Second stage does the same thing all the time. But then it gets interesting because now the control values affect what this does, they affect what this does, and they affect what this does. Look at what I'm doing. I'm calling the last stage this and this. And the reason is because I'm sharing the register file. But you know, as well as I do, that when I talk about the register file in the decode stage, it's for reading. And when I talk about the register file in the write back stage, it's for writing. So Sankey, it's two different register files, but it's not. It's one register file with two different purposes used at two different times. OK, are we clear on that? All right, so there's our model. And we've talked about this, so we won't go through that again. But that's just a review about the control paths. And you can see in red all the control signals. And it's a, it's a, a two-level control. We've got our main control up here. And we've got our second level just for ALU control here, just the way we talked about designing it back in single cycle. So we didn't modify that. What's new are, is these blue pipeline registers. We put in four pipeline registers. Um, and that's what's new. We talked about how pipelining can get us into trouble. It has to detect and, and resolve the hazards. So we'll move on from there. We talked about uh, data hazards, read after write data hazards. One way to fix it is just to stall. Put in what's called a bubble. In other words, just don't do anything in the pipeline. Waste the opportunity until what? Until this is late enough that we can do it without a red arrow. So now it's forward in time. That's one possibility. Not a very good one. That's not really fixing it. Um, another way is to um, have forwarding. Um, you can see what's being done here. The hardware from here allows us to connect to the ALU's input. This is not a different ALU. It's the same ALU one clock cycle later. So so much stuff. Feedback. So we need to have a mux here that says, do I take that or do I take that? And so I forward into the ALU. Another solution is to be able to forward from the ALU two cycles later. Not one cycle later, but two cycles later into the ALU, which would mean I'd have to delay it somewhere. And the obvious best place to delay it is in, is in here, um, or with a special little register. Um, but since it's already stored anyway. So that's forwarding, also known as bypassing. So here, let's go through the information about forwarding or bypassing. Bypassing is the old name. Forwarding is kind of the, the more current name. You take the result from the earliest point that you have it, when the data value is available to you. It doesn't have to be in the register. It's just earlier in the pipeline, wherever you can get it. Um, if it exists in any of the pipeline state registers, 
because it, you don't have to wait for it to get all the way back into the register file. Pipeline registers are registers too. You're holding them in registers. As soon as it's computed and you have it, you could now send it somewhere else. And you forward it to the functional unit that needs it. Usually it's the ALU that needs it in that cycle. So you forward it to the place that needs it in the cycle that needs it. Okay, for the ALU functional unit, that means that the inputs can come from any pipeline register, not just from the IDEX register. Let's go back. Normally speaking, ALU inputs come from this pipeline register, which is, sorry, the ALU inputs come from the pipeline register here, which is the instruction decode execute pipeline. Normally, they just, you know, they come out of here and go in that pipeline, and then they go in here in the next clock cycle. That's the normal place. But what we're claiming is now we could get them from this pipeline register or even this pipeline register and send them into the ALU. Well, that's going to mean the ALU is going to have three possible uh, inputs. Not three possible inputs. Each ALU input could have three possible values. Okay, um, and other functional units might need similar pipelining, not just the ALU. Okay, um, for example, the data memory might need things forwarded to its inputs that don't come from the EX, um, uh, whatever it's called, MEM uh, pipeline stage. That's the normal place. The EX output becomes the MEM input, but we don't require that. We could also have forwarding from some other uh, pipeline. The idea is given in the beginning there. You forward from any place that exists, the earliest place that exists, to the place that needs it. With forwarding, we can achieve a CPI of 1, even in the presence of data dependencies. And we should add almost, because the, the uh, load hazards don't fix with pipelining. All right, so that's kind of the blurb. That's the talk. I'm hoping that the combination of words and pictures helps you get the big idea. Is anybody here quite confused? Need some help? Pipelining has got you lost. Forwarding has got you lost. You're not sure what hazards are all about. This seems very strange. Why are we doing this, Hoja? I don't want to meet the devil. Please leave, let him to tell me to leave me alone. <laughs> Send an angel, please. No devils. <laughs> all right. Everybody's okay? All right. Well, it's a good time to take a break then. I'm glad you're all okay. Let's go get some coffee or tea and some air. Good.